Thank you very much, uh, Tamar. Um, this series of three weekly talks will attempt to briefly survey the history of Hanukkah from ancient to modern times. The theme which connects all three presentations is how Jewish holidays are created and develop, focusing, of course, on the holiday of Hanukkah. Unlike most of our holidays, the celebration of Hanukkah is not commanded in the Hebrew Bible. So our series begins today with a brief look back at the scriptural origins of the holiday and its historical context in Second Temple times. Since Hanukkah commemorates the post-biblical victory of the Maccabees and their rededication of the temple, we will begin by surveying the biblical and Second Temple period antecedents, that is to say, the forerunners to what has become the holiday of Hanukkah. The first of these antecedents to Hanukkah is the description of the dedication of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, in the desert found in Numbers chapter 7. And it came to pass on the day that Moses had made an end to setting up the tabernacle, the Mishkan, and had anointed it and sanctified it, and all the furniture thereof, and the altar, and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, Nisi'e Yisrael, the heads of their fathers' houses, offered, these were the princes of the tribes, these are they who were over them that were numbered. And they brought their offerings before the Lord, six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for every two princes um, before the tabernacle. Um, this chapter, uh, the chapter be, uh, continues for 89 verses with the detailed list of the offerings of each of the tribes brought by the princes, Nisi'e Yisrael, that is, the tribe's leaders or heads. As we will see in the next session, in rabbinic times, this chapter and beyond into the following chapter was chosen in rabbinic times as the Torah reading for Hanukkah. Um, we have here a 19th century artist's quite imaginative depiction of the enclosure around the desert tabernacle with the burnt offerings being sacrificed before it on the altar open to heaven. Note that the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting, apparently with a cloud representing God's presence descending into the tent of meeting from above. The dedication of the altar of sacrificial offerings is mentioned in the summary of Numbers chapter uh, 7. This is toward the end of that chapter. This was the dedication offering of the altar, Zot Chanukata Mizbeach, after it had been anointed. Now here, notice that we have our first mention of the Hebrew term Chanukah, we're here referring to the Chanukah Tamizbeach, the dedication of the altar in the desert in Sinai. This term, Chanukah, will become the name for the post-biblical holiday of Chanukah. We have here a depiction, an artist's depiction, and an actual model of the altar, the desert tabernacle, and its enclosures. Now, at the end of chapter 7 of Numbers, uh, we learn that the Ohel Moe, the tent of meeting, is now to provide the earthly dwelling place of God, elsewhere called the Mishkan, from the Hebrew verbal root, Shin Kaf Nun, to dwell, where God descends from heaven, meets with Moses, and speaks with him. And Moses went into the tent of meeting that he, God, might speak with him. Then he heard the voice speaking unto him from above the ark cover that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, and he spoke unto him. Now, as already mentioned, in our next session, we will come back to the role of Numbers chapter 7 when we deal with the holiday of Hanukkah in the liturgy and in rabbinic tradition. Significantly, let's see, when Moses uh, is, was first commanded by God to tell the people to construct the Mishkan, 
here referred to as the Mikdash, the sanctuary, it is clear that this is where God is going to dwell among the people of Israel. As it says there, Va'asuli Mikdash v'shachanti betocham, and let them make me a sanctuary, a Mikdash, that I may dwell among them. This key verse foretells what is described in Numbers chapter 7, that when the sanctuary will be completed, God will descend from heaven and enter his new dwelling place on earth, the Mishkan. The sanctuary, that is to say the holy place, the Mikdash, will provide the all-important meeting place, the Moed, of God with man on earth, as will the first and second temples in Jerusalem. Now, note that further, further on in the same chapter in Exodus, we also learn extensively of the menorah, here translated the lampstand, which will play such an important role in the continuation of the Hanukkah story. In Exodus chapter 25, we read, The Lord said to Moses, Make a lampstand of pure gold, menorat zahav. Hammer out its base and shaft, and make its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches are to extend from one side of the lampstand, three on one side, and three on the other. Note that this biblical menorah has seven branches to hold seven lamps, while our Hanukkah menorah will have eight branches, nine, including the shamash, which will serve to uh, light the other lights. To distinguish between these two kinds of menorah, in modern Hebrew, the Hanukkah menorah is called a Hanukkiah. And here we have a modern attempt to create a model of what the golden menorah may have looked like. Um, Exodus chapter 25 uh, continues with an extensive and detailed description of exactly how the biblical menorah is to be designed and constructed. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms are to be on one branch, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand, there are to be four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud shall be under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. Now, over here on the note, which uh, it took from the Encyclopedia Judaica entry on the menorah, it, it explains that the fourth cup at the t was at the top of the central shaft, above the places where the branches joined it. Now, <clears throat> the expression translated here, almond flowers with buds and blossoms, mishukaim kaftor v'ferach, is the subject of much discussion. It's a difficult passage. Rashi, in his extensive commentary to Exodus 25, verses 33 to 35, says that we have here one of the five verses in Scripture, the syntactical construction of which is undecided. What is clear is that the image of the capitals supporting the, the cups for oil atop the branches of the menorah is basically botanical, drawn from the structure of a flower consisting of a bud in scientific terminology, the calyx, supporting below, below supporting blossoms above. Now this was thought to be an image of such beauty that in rabbinic times, the expression kaftor v'ferach was employed to compliment a scholar for making a particularly appropriate comment. Now this you find in Genesis Rabbah and in an earlier text of Votri Rabbi Yatan. In modern Hebrew, the expression kaftor v'ferach is used to express wonder at a thing of particular beauty. Curiously, the unique beauty of the golden seven-branched menorah led to the prohibition of making its exact likeness. We find this prohibition mentioned in uh, Talmud Bavli, uh, Rosh Hashanah, and indeed even in the Shulchan Aruch. This is one of the reasons that the Hanukkah menorah, the Hanukkiah, 
is not meant to be a replica of the seven-branched biblical menorah, but has eight branches, or nine, including the shamash. The detailed description of the golden menorah continues in Exodus chapter 25. The branches and the buds and branches shall be of one piece with the lampstand hammered out of pure gold. Then make it seven lamps and set them up upon it so that they light the space in front of it. Its wicks, its wick trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. A talent, about 75 pounds or 35 kilograms of pure gold, is to be used for the lampstand and all of these accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. Now, just to clarify for a second, um, when it says a talent about 75 pounds or 35 kilograms of pure gold, um, I actually looked this up, and the estimated value of 75 pounds of pure gold today would be close to $2 million. Note that the seven-branched menorah, as having been looted by the Romans from the Second Temple, after its destruction in 70 CE, appears in the first century CE Arch of Titus in Rome. Rather famous image here. In modern times, an artistic rendition of the biblical menorah stands before the Knesset in Jerusalem. Those of you who visited there would certainly have seen this very impressive uh, model of the, of the temple menorah. And perhaps even more interestingly, um, the biblical menorah serves as a symbol of the state of Israel, which we see here in the blue, um, the blue image. Um, and it's worth mentioning that this way of depicting the golden menorah flanked by olive branches is based on a vision of the future menorah in Zechariah. I think I'll just read you that passage in Zechariah, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. I see a gold menorah lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive branches, shnei zetim, by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. Now, Leviticus uh, 24 speaks about the Ner Tamid. The lamps of the menorah, referred to as the Ner Tamid, had to be continually tended by the priests to be filled with pure olive oil to stay alight. In Leviticus 24, there we read, The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so the lamps may be kept burning continually. That's where the expression near Tamid appears. Outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant Law in the Tent of Meeting, Aaron is to tend the lamps before the Lord from evening till morning, continually. This is to be the lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The lamps on the, of, on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord must be tended continually. Now we have here a very, I think a very nice book illustration, color, um, in which the, uh, the caption there at the bottom in Hebrew uh, would translate something like, this is the menorah and Aaron the one who is putting oil in the lamps. Uh, this, this illustration is from the 13th century in northern, in a northern French Hebrew miscellany. Um, the Ner Tamid command in Leviticus eventually evolves into the Ner Tamid, the eternal light, hanging before the ark in the contemporary synagogue and since the Middle Ages at least. Um, now it's worth mentioning that going back to Numbers chapter 4, um, the tabernacle and its contents were portable. The tent of meeting was repeatedly taken apart and assembled as the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. As we read in Numbers chapter, 20, uh, chapter 4, 
This is the work of the Kohathites at the Tent of Meeting, the care of the most holy things. When the camp is to move, Aaron and his sons are to go in and take down the shielding curtain and put it over the Ark of the Covenant Law. Uh, this chapter goes on and says, After Aaron and his sons had finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, only then are the Kohathites to come and do the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry these things that are in the tent of meeting. Um, now, jumping back to Exodus 13, um, it should be recalled that during the 40 years of wandering in the desert of Sinai, the Israelites were led by God as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, as we read in Exodus chapter 13. After leaving Sukkot, they camped at Etam on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in, the pillar, in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Okay, now we're going to make a, a pretty big jump um, to uh, out of the, uh, the Humash, out of the, uh, the Torah, the five books of Moses. And we're going to go into uh, the Nevi'im and in the, we're going to go to the time of Solomon. Because the next biblical antecedent to the rededication of the temple by the Maccabees is the dedication of the first temple in Jerusalem in the time of King Solomon. This took place in 957 BCE. Now, as we read this text, note that in this impassioned dedicatory address, King Solomon asks, Will God really dwell with man on earth? This theological question will be addressed in a rabbinic text we will read in our coming session next week. So here's what we have in 1 Kings chapter 8. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the whole community of Israel. He spread the, the palms of his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel in the heavens above and in the earth below, there is no God like you. But will God really dwell with man on earth? Even the heavens to their utmost reaches cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Note that King Solomon concludes this dedicatory address with an emotional petition to God. May your eyes be open to the supplication of your servant and the supplication of your people Israel, and may you heed them whenever they call upon you. Now when Solomon finished offering to the Lord all this prayer and supplication, he rose from where he had been kneeling in front of the altar, the altar of the Lord, his hands spread out to heaven. He stood and in a loud voice blessed the whole congregation of Israel. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never abandon or forsake us. The king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices to the Lord. Now, moving on, alas, the first temple was destroyed in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylonia, the king of Babylon, by the commander of his army, Nebuzaradan, when Jerusalem was conquered in 586 BCE, as we read in 2 Kings 25. On the seventh day of the fifth month of the fifteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, Nebuzaradan, advisor to the king and commander of his armies, entered Jerusalem. He burned down the temple, the palace, and the houses of all the important people in Jerusalem, 
and his soldiers tore down the walls. Then Nebuzaradan took away to Babylonia the people who were left in the city, the remaining skilled workers, and those who had deserted to the Babylonians. But he left in Judah some of the poorest people who owned no property and put them to work in the vineyards and fields. Now, the biblical period ends in the 6th century BCE with the Edict of Cyprus of Cyrus. Uh, this uh, edict was uh, proclaimed in 538 539 BCE, and this is actually what is mentioned in the last two verses of the Hebrew Bible, of our Bible, as we read in 2 Chronicles 36, the very end of the Bible. And in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, when the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah was fulfilled, and the Lord roused the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia to issue a proclamation throughout his realm, by word of mouth and in writing as follows. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any one of you, any one of, of all his people, the Lord God be with him and let him go up. Now we have another version of this proclamation um, and the subsequent building of the second temple in, Jeru in, in Jerusalem uh, mentioned in the book of Ezra. Um, very interestingly, this biblical account seems to re be reflected in a remarkable archaeological discovery known as the Cyrus Cylinder. This Cyrus Cylinder is an ancient clay cylinder on which is a written declaration in Akkadian cuneiform script in the name of Persia's Achaemenid King Cyrus the Great. It dates from the 6th century BC and was discovered in the ruins of the ancient city of, Meso of, Babylon, of Babylon in 1879. It is now on display in the British Museum in London. Now, the Cyrus cylinder if translated from the uh, Akkadian, uh, says the following. In this description, uh, King Cyrus of Persia proudly recalls his having returned conquered people to their homes in their native lands. I returned the images of the gods who had resided there, that is to say in Babylon, in Babylon to their places, and I let them dwell in eternal abodes. I gathered all their inhabitants and returned them to their dwellings. And the end of the prayer, the people of Babylon blessed my kingship, and I settled all the people, and I settled all the lands in peaceful abodes. Um, now, the return of some, but not all, of the Jewish exiles to Judah and Jerusalem, known in Hebrew as Shivat Zion, the return to Zion, took place over the course of about a hundred years during the 6th and 5th centuries BCE. Um, the return to Zion, to Zion, the Shivat Zion, led to the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem and the rebuilding and rededication of the temple and its altar. Um, we read in Ezra chapter 3. In the second year after their arrival at the house of God at, at Jerusalem, in the second month, the priests and the Levites and all who had returned from the captivity of Jerusalem, as their first step, appointed Levites from the age of 20 and upwards to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. When the builders had laid the foundations of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals were stationed to give praise to the Lord. Now, chapter 3 continues in a very, I think, interesting way. Um, 
chapter 3 of the book of Ezra notes that when the foundations of the second temple were completed, some younger people rejoiced. But some of the older people who had seen the magnificent first temple wept because this renewed temple seemed so unimpressive in comparison. As we read there, And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord, because the foundation of the, Lord, of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. Um, the book of Ezra continues with the building and completion of the temple. So the elders of the Jews progressed in the building urged on by the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, son of Edo, and they brought the building to completion under the aegis of the God of Israel and by the order of Cyrus and Darius and King Artaxerxes of Persia. Um, we have a nice uh, image here uh, of the uh, rebuilding of the, of the temple. Um, here in the, this slide, we have, I think, a very nice vintage engraving that depicts the work of rebuilding the temple. I think you can see them busy blowing their horns and women reading their books, etc., etc. Uh, Ezra chapter 6 carries on. In 520 BCE, the second temple is dedicated and the prescribed sacrifices are performed. The house was finished on the third of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. The Israelites, the priests, and the Levites, and all the other exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. And they sacrificed for the dedication of this house of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and 12 goats, as a purification offering for all of Israel, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. They appointed the priests in their courses and the Levites in their divisions for the service of God in Jerusalem, according to the prescription of the book of Moses. Uh, we have here this very, very beautiful mosaic. In 333 BCE, a young Macedonian monarch, Alexander III, decisively defeats King Darius of Persia at the famous Battle of Isis, dramatically depicted in the first century BCE Alexander mosaic, now on display in Naples. I think I read someplace that there is over a million tesserae, a million little um, cubes in this very highly covered and detailed mosaic. Um, I'll just note about Alexander that until the age of 16, Alexander was treated by none other than the very famous Greek philosopher Aristotle. He remained undefeated in battle and is widely considered to be one of history's greatest and most successful military commanders. Also, uh, I think a very wise uh, leader uh, who, instead of pitting, moving populations around and pitting one nation against the other, um, brought them all together under the aegis of his empire and bringing them into his armies, Britsig created a very, for a small time, a very unified um, empire. Now, the post-biblical period effectively begins with the conquests of Alexander the Great of Macedonia, who created a vast empire from India on the east to Egypt in the west. The death of Alexander in 323 BCE at the young age of 32 led to the breakup of his vast empire into separate kingdoms ruled by the Diadochi, 
uh, Greek here translates his successors, that is to say his rival gener generals who succeeded Alexander. There were basically four such kingdoms, the most important of which, the one on the, uh, in the east, um, is um, the most important of which of, for our story of Hanukkah is the kingdom of Syria ruled by the Greek-speaking Seleucids. You see that in the yellow there. Now, as we close in on the Maccabean revolt, which is what we're headed for, note that one of its causes was the prohibition of circumcision and other and the order to sacrifice swine on the newly erected altar of Zeus by the Seleucid ruler Antiochus Epiphanes, leading to the execution of those Jews who resisted. Now, we're getting to the Maccabees finally, and here um, we mentioned that our earliest source for the origin of the holiday of Hanukkah, our holiday of Hanukkah, is a group of works known as the Books of Maccabees. Now, the first book of Maccabees is an originally Jewish account, originally written in Hebrew, of the Maccabean Rebellion and the rededication of the Temple in Jerusalem. As I just said, it was originally written in Hebrew. It and other related works were preserved in Greek and other languages by various Christian churches. Now, we only have it because it was preserved uh, by some of the Christian churches. Um, the book, the books of Maccabees refers to a series as the whole general category of the books of Maccabees refers to a series of deuterocanonical deuter books. That is to say, they belong to a kind of second canon contained in various versions of the Bible. I won't go into all of it. Actually, I have here a list of eight different works which are referred to as the books as various books of the Maccabees. What I will say at this point is that um, most important for our purposes here is the first book of Maccabees, which, as we said, was originally written in Hebrew, was preserved in the Septuagint, the Jewish um, translation of the Bible into Greek, um, second century BCE. And uh, the second um, book of Maccabees which was originally written in Greek, also preserved in the Septuagint. And the third book of Maccabees, which uh, was not included in the Septuagint, we may get to later, uh, if time permits, because it preserves a really fascinating um, story, um, which I think is a kind of uh, alternate version of the miracle of Hanukkah. But if time permits, we'll get to that. Now, how the rebellion of the Maccabees began is related in the second chapter of 1 Maccabees. Then the king's officers who were enforcing the apostasy came to the city of Modi'in to make the Jews offer idolatrous sacrifice. Mattathias said in a loud voice, We will not obey the king's words by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. But just then, a Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer idolatrous sacrifice upon the altar in Modi'in according to the king's, the Greek king's command. Now when Mattathias saw it, he gave vent to righteous anger. He ran and killed him upon the altar and then killed the king's officer who was forcing them to sacrifice. And he tore down the altar. Thus he burned with zeal for the law, as Pinchas did against Zimri, the son of Salu. Now all of that, as you see down here below, that's a story that's related in uh, the book of Numbers, um, in which uh, Pinchas uh, rises up against uh, Zimri and Cosby, and uh, for their idolatrous behavior and slop, slaughters them there on a spear, as far as I recall. Now, going back to 1 Maccabees, 
Then, Maccab- then Mattathias cried out in the city with a loud voice, saying, Let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. And he and his sons fled to the hills and left all that they had in the city. Um, the first book of Maccabees continues with the victory of Judah Maccabee and his brothers and their redemption of the temple on the 25th of the month of Kislev in, 60, in 164 BCE. 25 Kislev, of course, becomes the first day of Hanukkah. Um, as we see in, as we read in Maccabees, in 1 Maccabees chapter 4, Then said Judas and his brothers, the Maccabean sons of Mattathias, Behold, our enemies are crushed. Let us go up and cleanse the sanctuary and dedicate it. Early in the morning on the 25th day of the ninth month, which is the month of Kislev, in the 148th year, um, we go on and we read, uh, they rose and offered sacrifice as the law directs on the new altar of burnt offerings which they had built. Then Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at the season, the days of dedication of the altar should be observed with gladness and joy for eight days, beginning with the 25th day of the month of Kislev. This is how a holiday is born, right? Uh, Judas and his brothers, Judah the Maccabee, declare a a holiday that is to be observed in forever. Now, um, Josephus, the first century CE general and historian writing in Greek, actually for a a, a non-Jewish audience, a Greek audience, says that this festival is called Phota, Lights. And this is actually what he says there in Antiquities of the Jews. Now, Judas celebrated the festival of the restoration of the sacrifices of the temple for eight days. And he honored God by hymns and psalms. Nay, they were so very glad at the revival of their customs that when, after a long time of intermission, they unexpectedly had regained the freedom of their worship, that they made it a law for their posterity, that they should keep a festival on account of the restoration of their temple worship for eight days. And from that time to this, we celebrate this festival and call it lights, the Greek phota. Now, the story of Hanukkah is related in the al Hanisim prayer for Hanukkah, which we insert into the 18th benediction of the Amidah, uh, mod- the penultimate benediction, which begins uh, Modim, and into the second benediction of Birkata Mazon, the grace after meals, beginning Nodei Lecha. We thank you. So here's the, um, the benediction. And we thank you for the miracles, for the redemption, for the mighty deeds, for the saving acts, and for the wonders which you have wrought for our ancestors in those days at this time. In the days of Matetiahu, the son of Yochanan the high priest, the Hasmonean and his sons, when the wicked Hellenic government rose up against your people Israel to make them forget your Torah and violate the decrees of your will, but you, in your abounding mercy, stood by them in the time of their distress. You waged their battles, defended their rights, and avenged the wrong done to them. You delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak and the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the wicked into the hands of the righteous, and the wanton sinners into the hands of those who occupy yourself themselves with your Torah. You made a great and holy name for yourself in your world and effected a great deliverance and redemption for your people Israel to this very day. Then your children entered the shrine of your house, cleansed your temple, purified your sanctuary, kindled lights in your holy courtyards, and instituted these eight days of Hanukkah 
to give thanks and praise to your, your great name. Now, like much of Jewish liturgy, the al Hanisim prayer is hard to date. A shorter version is found in Masechet Sofrim. Um, Masechet Sofrim is one of what we call the minor tractates of the Talmud, of the Babylonian Talmud, basically only because it's, it was added, it's printed at the end of the printed edition, the Vilna edition of the Babylonian Talmud. But it seems to not come from Babylonia, so it's not really part of the, ba of the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, it comes from, it seems to have been composed, compiled in Eretz Israel in about the 8th century. Now, that gives us a rough date, maybe the last possible date for when this prayer has came into existence. Though it's, we don't really have any written prayer books uh, so much at this time, so it, it, from that time on, it, we, we find it in various uh, manuscripts of the Sidur uh, as it evolves. This apparently early version of Al Hanisim features a petition missing in various later versions. There it says, So also, O Lord our God and God of our fathers, perform for us miracles and wonders, and we will give thanks unto thy name forever. Well, basically, we've come to the end of this, um, let's see how we're doing for time. We've come to the end of our excursion into the origins of the holiday of Hanukkah, which begins this year on Sunday evening, December 18, with the lighting of the first Hanukkah light. For that reason, our third and final talk will not be broadcast live, as this broadcast is being broadcast, but will be pre-recorded and made available on the Beit Avichai website for you to view at your convenience. It remains to say, perhaps echoing Josephus, Chag Orim Sameach, Happy Festival of Lights. Um, I, think, I think we have a little bit of time, maybe another five minutes, if that's okay. And I thought maybe I would um, just tell you the story. Well, you know, we have an expression called, um, we say, the elephant in the room. And in fact, in 3rd Maccabees, we have what I think is a really fascinating story, um, which um, tells of the persecution. Actually, 3rd Maccabees doesn't really, it's not really part of Maccabees. It doesn't really tell the story of the Maccabees. It transpires in Egypt a little bit before the period of the Maccabees. But still in all, it's quite interesting. I'll just read you a few snippets of this fifth and sixth chapter of third Maccabees, which I think has a really terrific story. Then he, the Pharaoh, King Ptolemy, called Hermon, who was in charge of the elephants. He was full of rage, altogether fixed in his furious design. I'll just mention that in the previous chapters, this King uh, Ptolemy, Pharaoh of Egypt, after having won some very, very impressive victories, makes a tour of his various um, uh, possessions. And among them, he visits where he, he goes and visits um, the various uh, sanctuaries of the pagan people. And there he, of course, enters the sanctuaries, the pagan sanctuaries, and offers sacrifice. He gets to Jerusalem and wants to do the same. However, he... Um, He's not allowed to enter the, the temple because this, the Holy of Holies, the this, this sanctuary itself, is only entered by the high priest once a year on Yom Kippur. So he's not allowed to enter. And he's enraged at not being allowed to enter. So what does he do? He goes back to Egypt and imprisons all of the Jews of Alexandria, where he is, and puts them into his hippodrome. They're imprisoned, shackled in his hippodrome, which is his huge amphitheater, uh, which was used for horse racing and chariot racing, etc. Okay, now the story goes on. He commanded Hermon, who was in charge of the elephants, that with a quantity of unmixed wine and handfuls of incest, infused to drug the elephants early on the following day. 
These 500 elephants were, when infuriated by the copious drafts of frankincense, to be led to the execution of death upon the Jews. The king, after issuing these orders, went to his feasting and gathered together all those of his friends and the army who hated the Jews most. The master of the elephants, Hermon, fulfilled his commission punctually. The Jews, breathless with momentary suspense, stretched forth their hands and prayed the greatest God in mournful strange, strains, hoping to help them speedily. And the master of the elephants urged the beasts on into a most maniacal state, drenched them with incense and wine, and decked them with frightful instruments. But the Jews, when the elephants went out of the gate, followed by the armed force, and when they saw the dust raised by the throng and heard the loud cries of the crowd, though they had come to the last moment of their lives, to the end of what seemed tremblingly expected, they gave way, therefore, to lamentations and mo moans. They kissed each other. The nearest of kin to each other hung about one another's necks, fathers about their sons, mothers their daughters, and women held their infants to their breasts, which drew what seemed their last milk. Going on to chapter 6. And Eliezer, Eleazar, an illustrious priest of the, count of the country, who had attained to length of days and whose life had been abandoned, had been adorned with virtue, caused the el elders who were around him to cease to cry out unto the Lord and prayed thus, O King, mighty in power, O Most High, Almighty God, who regulates the whole creation with his tender mercy, look upon the seed of Abraham, upon the children of the sanctified Jacob, your sanctified inheritance, O Father, now being wrongly destroyed as strangers in a strange land. And now we conclude. Now at this time, had ended his, Eliezer had, Eleazar had ended his prayer. The king came along to the Hippodrome with the wild beasts and with his tumultuous power. When the Jews saw this, they uttered a loud cry to heaven so that the adjacent valleys resounded and caused an irreparable lamentation throughout the army. And now comes the climax. When, when the all-glorious, all-power and true God, God displayed his holy countenance and opened the gates of heaven, from which two angels, dreadful in form, came down and re were visible to all but the Jews. And they stood opposite and filled the en enemy's armies with confusion and cowardice, and bound them with immovable fetters. They turned back the animals upon the armed forces of the Greeks, which followed them, and the animals trod them down and destroyed them. So that's the, um, and now the, the end of the story. The king, Ptolemy, then departed the city and called his financier to him and asked him to provide seven days quantity of, rye, of, of, of wine and other materials for the feasting of the Jews. He decided that they should keep a gladsome festival of deliverance in the very place in which they expected to meet their destruction. So the king declares a holiday for the Jews to celebrate, to memorialize their escape from their imminent destruction. They made a public ordinance to commemorate these things for generations to come, as long as they should be sojourners. Thus they established these days as days of mirth, not for the purpose of drinking and luxury, but because God had saved them. So we have here another example of how a holiday is created, a, a local holiday for Egyptian Jewry, um, which memorializes how they were saved from this very weird um, execution by trampling of elephants. Okay, so that's about it for now. Um, I just wanted to uh, conclude by saying um, that um, in the remaining time, which we have, um, your reactions, comments, and questions about this first talk are invited and will be addressed to the best of my ability 
And I would like to thank all of you for your participation. And those wonderful folks here at Beit Avi Chai who have helped so much in the preparation of this presentation. Thanks, Tamar. Thank you very much, Mark, for taking us to the early sources. And you want to say a word or two about where we will be continuing on to next session? Um, what, what, what the next uh, next sessions? Um, you, you want to say a few words about the sources and the period we'll be dealing with? The coming sessions? Yes. No, okay. Just next week. Yeah, okay. So a week from today, Sunday, um, we're going to go on to what perhaps is more familiar the rabbinic traditions about uh, Hanukkah. Um, we'll talk about the halakha of Hanukkah found in the Babylonian Talmud. And um, I'm gonna devote most of the session to reading a, a very, what I think is a very, very interesting, apparently a rabbinic sermon uh, that was given or meant to be given on Hanukkah, probably Shabbat Hanukkah, which curiously enough doesn't mention the holiday of Hanukkah, but it's related to Hanukkah by being, it's a sermon eventually to the uh, first verses of the book of um, Numbers chapter seven, which we noticed was the reading for Hanukkah. Uh, and in that way it connects to Hanukkah. Um, Scott would, would like to know, where is the earliest reference of the single vessel of oil? Oh, I think that goes back to Numbers chapter 7, um, when it, or maybe in Exodus, where uh, we have the description of the menorah uh, and the way that it was very elaborate description of the way that the menorah was to be built, uh, constructed. And you have the seven, um, well, like six branches and a central seventh branch and on top of these capitals which looked like some kind of uh, botanical buds flowers something like that uh, on each capital sat a, um, um, a, a sort of a bowl which was filled with oil there were wicks placed in the in the um, in the oil and that was lit and that's how the menorah was uh, was lit Okay, we have well, this many thank you here. Um, what well, he meant, he, he, the question continues, meant the discovery of the single vessel of oil that was to hold found by the Maccabim. Um, About the, what's we call the Nes, nes uh, Pacha Shemen, the miracle of the, of the oil. Well, we're gonna get to that. I'm gonna hold off on that for a little bit. We're gonna get to that next week. Um, that's what's mentioned in the Talmud, in the Babylonian Talmud, the Talmud Bavli, Bavli Shabbat 24a, if I recall correctly, when it, it relates the story of how the Maccabees, when they reconquered the temple, the temple site in Jerusalem, um, the temple was still there, but it had been defiled by the Greeks who had been offering uh, idolatrous sacrifices, even pigs on the altar, and they didn't find any uh, pure oil uh, in, uh, enough to light the, the new menorah. Um, so they, um, they found one cruise of oil, one big uh, amphora of oil that had the, um, the high priest's seal on it, and they knew that this was one pure cruise of oil, and it was really only enough to light the menorah, the new menorah, for eight, for one day, but miraculously, and this is what we call the miracle of Hanukkah, miraculously the, the menorah burned for eight days. In the meantime, they were able to make new pure olive oil and to continue to light the menorah. So why eight days? The, what, the last question is uh, regarding why eight, specifically eight days? Because, they, because the menorah burned for eight days. And it, it, in a way, um, according to some of our sources, maybe I'll throw that in next time. Um, in a way, uh, Hanukkah becomes a kind of re-celebration or a new celebration of Sukkot, which was seven days plus one um, Shmini Yatzeret, uh, which according to some of our sources had not been 
um, performed, had not been celebrated in the years previous because the Greeks were, uh, were in, in control and Jews were not performing their ceremonies. So Hanukkah becomes a kind of, not just a rededication of the temple and the menorah, but a rededication of the holiday of Sukkot, and that's why it's eight days, because Sukkot is seven plus one, Shmini Yatzeret. Great, so we're looking forward as we move towards Hanukkah. We'll learn more together with you, hopefully next week. We hope to see you all again with us. Thank you very much, Professor Mark Bregman, and thank you everyone for joining us. Good evening. Mar, and thank you. I wanna add a thanks to all of the great folks here at, uh, at uh, Beit Avichai for their enormous help in preparing uh, these lectures. So thank you very much. Good night.